So right up front for disclosure, this is a video that the PR team for the recently released remake of System Shock is paying me to create. Hashtag ad and all that. But wait, before you click off the video in a fit of rage, let me tell you that as with similar such videos I've made in the past, the reason I even considered the deal was that I retained full creative control over the project, with zero pressure to spin things or be anything other than honest. I was basically asked to make a regular writing on games video on a particular game. And to me, that's a move that really shows confidence in their product. It's also why, and take this with whatever grain of salt you need to, I've been pretty glad to see that post-release coverage of the game, at a glance, has seemingly been so positive, because it means that you don't just have to take my word for it when I offer this remake a rather glowing recommendation. I've had a blast with this thing. And it's interesting, because outside of a distant appreciation for the importance of the franchise on the larger gaming landscape, I don't have a particular attachment to those old System Shock games. I'm approaching this remake as a relative newcomer, but what this remake has taught me is just how cohesive and coherent the vision behind this game really is. You know, the series is considered classic for a reason, as well as how far a new coat of paint really has gone here. Because make no mistake, while there are a number of subtle but nonetheless appreciated quality of life improvements here, you know, making it so that you don't need to navigate different mouse modes to put things in your inventory, then return to free look as was the case in the enhanced edition of the original, the System Shock remake is, at its core, a respectable effort to retain the mechanical and systemic identity of a game that really helped put the immersive sim genre on the map. Which is to say, the game really doesn't hold your hand here, beyond teaching you the basics of control. It's not so much a game where your agency is celebrated, or you're given all the tools and told you can do whatever you like with them. I guess it would be more accurate to say you're forced to make do with what you can get your hands on. This applies to weapons, tools, power-ups, help narrative and objectives. There is a path to be followed here, a really rich world to be uncovered, with writing that legitimately holds up super super well, and environmental storytelling aplenty. It's just that by design, the game just places it in the world and is more than willing to let you get lost in the nooks and crannies of this cyber labyrinth trying to find it. Like the AI Shodan running amok within the walls of the citadel you find yourself on, there's a deliberately cold, distant vibe to proceedings, where you are just placed in a hostile environment and have to assume that your goal is to get out of that environment. But honestly, this hands-off approach is why I've been having such a great time with the System Shock remake. Not only is it thematically and tonally resonant, not only is exploring these maze-like levels rewarding enough in and of itself, with discoveries you find on the way having the potential to radically alter the trajectory of your playthrough, but it's the fact that it really does feel like everything about how you play comes down to you. The game doesn't pause, for example, when you want to check your map, which you will be doing frequently. It doesn't pause when you want to rearrange your inventory. In fact, outside of creating a manual save slot, the game doesn't pause at all. All the while, enemy presence is so sporadic that any time you're spending performing an action as insignificant as, say, checking a crate or looting a body, is time you crucially aren't spending being aware of your surroundings. Even the smallest enemies can overwhelm you, and so the act of exploration is rendered infinitely more tense and engaging, where it feels like every Every move, no matter how small, has a measurable consequence on the next. While it's easy to tweak difficulty options at the start based on your preferences, on default this can be a pretty unforgiving game at times. That said, it's remarkably well balanced. The scope of these levels is surprisingly manageable. These maps may look huge, but you'd be surprised at how much ground you can cover in a short amount of time, coupled with a surprisingly generous checkpoint system, meaning that there's rarely a situation that can't be surmounted if you just throw yourself at it enough. In short, I imagine the term old school will be getting thrown around with wild abandon when discussing this game. But go back to even the enhanced edition of the original, which Night Dive also handled, and you'll see just how significant those subtle mechanical changes are. 
That older game is still really fun in its own right, but you will notice just how much more functional this remake feels. The team has carefully picked out and refined those aspects of old immersive sims that really matter, crafting a title that just consistently requires real focus on everything around you. And it's funny that for a game paying such homage to a title released in the early 90s, that in a sea of titles seeking to guide you by the nose every step of the way, this kind of gameplay experience feels downright refreshing. But one of the biggest, most obvious changes between the releases is the stark visual upgrade that's been applied. Man, I cannot get enough of how good this game looks. I described it as a new coat of paint earlier, but the reality is that what Night Dive has done here amounts to far more than just up resing assets, but rather fundamentally looking at the specific era the original released in and using that information to convey tone, story, and character traits that go beyond the original game's scope. If I could summarise the visual design in a word, it would be hazy. The team could have opted for some form of photorealism, but instead they choose to take the visual mush of the original, likely a result of technical limitations of the time, and manage to lovingly render it in a mix of modern sheen, intense lighting, and most notably of all, light pixelation. And in so doing, they take a piece of media that would fit right in with any similar cyberpunk sci-fi of the 80s and 90s, all speculating that the world would be a hovercar riddled flaming industrial bin by the year 2003 or something, and shift this palette into something evoking legitimate B-movie camp in the best possible way, as evidenced by the piles of goop breaking up your treks through sterile metal corridors, that same goop that the unsettlingly smooth, shambling, dead-eyed enemies explode into, this thing is glorious schlock, system schlock. The vibe of everything here could be summed up by the whole computer virus as literal virus aesthetic. There's an almost escapist fantasy to the game's vision of hacking the mainframe that's really brought to life here, and it's brilliant. This schlock extends to the game's now expanded intro too, no longer just Shodan coldly listing the events leading up to your awakening. You're put in control of your character here. You get to explore their room. You get to initiate the hack that gets you caught in the first place. And what I love about this is how much work the little details are already doing in establishing who you are. This is not a blank slate. This is a person with a small messy flat, a passion for 80s style cult media. They own a keytar. Help, they're a gamer. They have the original System Shock on their shelf. You you get the feeling that this is someone who appreciates the notion of being some kind of action hero hacker that nonetheless, far from the seven minutes Shodan originally says it takes for tri-optimum forces to find and apprehend you, these guys bust you immediately as soon as you start the hack for Citadel Files. Through mostly visual details, such as silent but eminently meaningful hand gestures, this intro frames your character as someone obsessed with those trappings of what it means to hack the system, man, and yet some someone who is also kind of bad at it, or at least not ready for the reality of the situation they're getting themselves into, as exemplified by the fact they offer zero resistance when told to, say, deactivate the ethics protocols for an all-controlling AI by a corporate executive. I get the sense there's an understandable fear within this character, crucially matching up with my gameplay. The seemingly endless, smoky, Nostromo-esque corridors heighten that fear that something could be lurking around the next corner or coming up behind you. The large system fans, the shimmer of these winding, claustrophobic interiors, all of it sells the idea that you, your character, are somewhere they aren't meant to be. Your character gets to live out their action hacker fantasies in all their pixelated glory, but in the process, they become akin to a virus in that massive computer that the now sentient AI, thinking themselves a god, is going to weed out using whatever tools they can muster. They are going to toy with you like you're a rat in a maze. Because as you can probably tell from this gameplay, I'm not great at this stuff either. This complex neural interface is a lot to get to grips with to internalise, and so much of the game's tension, at least for me, comes from having to navigate it all on the fly. You have to keep track of how many rounds are equipped, as well as what you still have left in your inventory, because reloading doesn't happen automatically. You have to think about what you're going to use if you run out of said ammo or energy. You have to think about can you use this thing as cover? Do you have enough time and keyboard dexterity to immediately equip a medkit and use it? Can you lean out just enough that you can hit one of the many 
enemies on screen without exposing too much of your own body? Where even is the enemy among the blinding glow in front of you? All these questions need to be answered and acted upon so quickly that actually carrying out this string of actions can be anxiety inducing. Said anxiety being the thing that leads to the countless deaths and respawns you will almost certainly encounter on your travels. And in so tying the tension of the game to how efficiently you can navigate this interface and process all the information it gives you in real time, something interesting happens. Your wares themselves aren't framed as some inherently dehumanizing, profane betrayal of the flesh, as can often be the case with cyberpunk media. They're just part of the cool action hacker fantasy, allowing you to do cool action hacker things. Rather, the question of humanity that does form at least part of the game's thematic core is tied more deeply to your own perseverance through this world of such ferocious metal and programming. You know, to panic in these situations, to react as a normal human being here, to not internalize these encounters as mere input to be processed into output as your robot enemies do, is to put yourself at greater risk of deletion, seemingly encouraging the approach if you can't beat the monstrously cold and distant AI convinced they're a god, join them. On a basic gameplay level though, by placing you in the shoes of some schlub, fundamentally unprepared for the situation they've gotten themselves into, Shodan's twisted, horrifying view of augmented existence is contrasted sharply, constantly, with your own more human, imperfect, but inherently more playful, fun use of the tools at your disposal. On top of an incredibly neat world to uncover, you also have a really compelling gameplay narrative driven by your choices. It honestly rules. All of this to say, I'm kind of blown away by the care and attention that's been afforded to this remake. Not just taking the easy route of upping the visuals and reducing the game's mechanical complexity into the shape of some bland shooter, but really examining every element of the source material, seeing how they could make things more approachable while sacrificing none of the systemic identity of that original, wholly maintaining that trust they place in your ability to figure things out, that belief that you don't always need your hand held. It is a game that requires some investment from you, above and beyond what typical games usually expect, but it's one I've found is equally willing to give back just as much as you put in. It's made me so much more interested in really going back and examining those older titles, the kind of result that I think any remake should be so lucky to achieve. So yeah, thanks again to System Shock for sponsoring this video and giving me such freedom to approach this game however I saw fit. Check it out on Steam at the link in the description. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all next time.